Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Batia Mesquita. She is Distinguished Professor of Psychology at the University of Leuven in Belgium, where she studies the role of culture in emotions and of emotions in culture and society. And she is also the director of the Center for Social and Cultural Psychology there. And today we're going to talk about her book, Between Us, How Cultures Create Emotions. So, Dr. Mosquita, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Ricardo. Thank so you. let's start perhaps with the most basic of questions here. What are emotions from a psychological perspective? Hmm. That's, you know, from a psychological perspective, I don't know. What, what we talk about emotions, I think, when uh, we have responses to uh, things that are out of the ordinary. So when things happen, our reactions to when things happen that um, threaten or, uh, or interfere with our expectations or goals or values, or to the contrary, that are really good for our views or for our values or, or so I think, you know, when you when you have positive or pleasant emotions, um, you can say that, you know, things are out of the ordinary, good, better than expected. You're nearing an ideal. You're close to a person who is going to give you everything or, um, you know, you're close to an event and and uh conversely when things are happening out of the ordinary that are particularly bad for what you want or for what your ideal is uh, you have negative emotions or what we call negative emotions we'll, we'll come back i think to the negative and the positive but but i would say it this is how we in our culture talk about emotions and the phenomena that we distinguish as emotions I'm not at all clear that that is one psychological mechanism, so to say. So when you say, what does it mean psychologically? I, I don't really know that I have the answer for you. But when we look at this domain of phenomena, this is usually what we consider emotions. Mm -hmm. in, certainly in our culture, we consider emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll get into more detail later on, later on but uh, do you think it's important to distinguish between feelings and emotions? You know, um, on the one hand, anything is, you know, if people want to call emotions feelings and feelings and emotions, I'm fine with it. It's just a definitional question, right? But on the other hand, I think it's important to distinguish between a number of phenomena. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish between things that we feel or signals that our body gives when something physical is happening, like when we itch or when we're hungry, and um, signals that we interpret as, you know, as being important for our goals. And so I think in you know, so that's one distinction that I find important. Another distinction that I find important is that when we have or do emotions, depending on how you want to talk about it, um, we don't always uh, want to focus on feelings. Feelings are, you know, for many Westerners, feelings are, when we think of what is an emotion, it's something. And when I ask my students in America or in Belgium, what is an emotion? They say, well, you feel it inside. But it's actually a lot of other things, emotions. And in fact, often when we talk about emotions, it's not even clear that we feel it, right? When I say to my uh, toddlers, don't do that, Mom, mommy's getting really, really angry. Is that, a, um, is that a feeling? I think not in the first place. It may be associated with a feeling, but it's mostly, I'm gonna not accept that. I'm, I'm you know, I have, I interpret your behavior as inappropriate. You can't do this and I'm gonna stop it, right? That's what you're saying. So I don't think emotions are feelings in any way. And so I think there are some distinctions to make, but having said that, how you exactly label those emotions, uh, label those distinctions, I'm not, you know, I'm not 
a deep believer of that, that, that those labels really matter. Mm -hmm. Do emotions serve particular functions? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, you know, when you think about what, what do we call the domain of emotions, if, if that's something extraordinary. So emotions happen when, when things are not as usual, right? When it's not a default. And so I think what we do is, is give meaning to them in terms of what we do know. So that's, that's one and reorient ourselves to give those out of the ordinary events a place. I mean, that's the, that's the lowest level of reintegration of those events uh, to give a place cognitively. Um, we also address what is going up. We address the opportunities. We, um, they, you know, emotions are involve often motivational stance, um, motivational changes. Like I want to, you know, I'm, what the example I mentioned, you know, when I'm angry, I say, I want to do anything that will stop um, that behavior. Or, you know, when, when I'm close to something that I desire, I want to approach. So in those abstract terms, you can talk about it, but you can also talk about it in some more concrete terms. What am I going to do? I'm going to, you know, I'm going to not accept it. I'm going to scream at you or I'm going to distance myself. Um, I also think, you know, so some of the functions are that people align to. What, what is an emotion is the signal and the realignment to something that is out of the ordinary. I think that we can all agree on that. There's also some, you can also look at it functionally uh, from a social level. When I have an emotion, I'm doing something in the relationship. So the, the mommy example was a good one. I'm, I'm, I'm realigning that relationship in that my child knows at that point that they can't just keep doing what you're doing. Um, often emotions tell us the emotions of other people, but also of ourselves include or imply a positioning of yourself and the other person and the relationship between us. Uh, when I say I admire you, I say something about you for the for, um, that you have something good that is maybe higher in some way than me that I'm submitting to you and I'm defining the relationship between us. Um, I think emotions often do that and emotions are also predictive of or, or come with behaviors that actually act in on the relationship and that change those relationships. So, so I think that's a function and then a third function that's also social is to the extent that we we read often the meaning of events from other people's emotions, right? If I'm, this is now not a very, uh, maybe not a very social example, but when I see everybody scared, I know that there is something to look at or to pay attention to. When I see everybody angry, I can start looking for, you know, who done it. Um, so in a way, um, in a way, other people's emotions give their interpretation of what's happening. And I can read from that what is what is the case, or I can contrast my own opinion with it. So all of the things. So I do think um, there are a lot of functions that emotions have all having to do with this realignment that emotions provides in the case of, of extraordinary events. And extraordinary, I mean almost, almost literal, right? Out of the ordinary, um, out of what we're expected or had hoped for or had, had counted on. Right. Uh, what can we learn about emotions by studying how people think about them and how, for example, they categorize them? Yeah. So this is a really tricky question because the way you ask that question assumes that there is an emotion apart, separate from how we're thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm not so sure of that. Um, I, so it, 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 uh, it converges with this idea of emotions as somehow available in the head and you just have to label them. And then of course the question is, 
which used to be the question in among psychologists it doesn't really matter how people talk about uh, emotions or maybe you know like just like any category it's it's more you can more readily pick up on it uh, you more readily see the the how the the instances of that category are similar and you see more differences um but i don't think that we first have emotions and then think about them you know as as i said i think that a lot of thinking goes into emotions um and i also think that the labeling of emotions so so basically i think that Emotions are based on at least two inputs. Um, one is the kinds of experiences that we have, that we've had, um, and you know, and and necessarily those are the kinds of experiences that we have had in our social and cultural environments, right, in our lives. Right. Um, and so, the and the other way is the way in which people in your social cultural environment categorize those experiences. And I think both of those are constitutive of, of the feelings that you have. So in a way, you know, how you live your life and how you think of your emotions is going to determine what kind of experiences you, you have. Um, so an, an example is in Many of the so-called honor societies, um, which if if I'm Portugal is sometimes counted, you know, the whole Mediterranean is is counted sometimes as one of those. You are based in Portugal, aren't you? <laughs> yes, yeah. I am. I am. Well, there's some Spanish research. I don't know how much you have in count that finds some of those honor effects. But what you find is that in honor cultures, when when defending your honor or your the way people perceive you is really important. Um, people have a words, people recognize honor violations or threat to honor in many more circumstances. Um, the social life is al also organized in a way to, to prevent those honor violations. So they're made very salient in the experience. Uh, you know, a lot of politeness, a lot of being nice to each other. Um, in part to prevent that people would misinterpret your uh, your interactions as you know as being uh, honor threatening, um, and so. But what you often see in countries where uh, where honor is so important is that the words, the emotion words that describes violations or threats or possibilities of threats to honor. Um, is is connected to uh, to one word. So the word for shame is a very broad word, much broader words than it would be in typical English or in typical Dutch, um, where really shame is res reserved for uh, for a very particular kind of experience. Whereas this honor threat is associated with, you know, it can be timidity, it can be shyness, it can be uh, shame and everything is categorized as in that same category. So I think experience, what I want to say is that experience and language, the way a culture is organized, the things that are important and the language for emotions are not independent. Mm -hmm. And that both of them feed into what we then recognize as emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so this is rephrasing your question a little bit is of uh, from, you know, what does it matter if we think about it in a certain way to, you know, the whole, the experience of emotions is thinking about reality or about our interactions in a certain way. Um, and so having the concepts available is constitutive of the experience and of what we, what we, what we have. So, so it's a very different way. I mean, I, I remember coming from the idea of there are emotions and how do people in different cultures describe them. Um, but that really changes if you think that there are no universal emotions as such and that people create those experiences at least as distinct from each other in their language and in their interactions. Um, and so um, the best guess we have is that how people talk about emotions actually reflects some of the 
reality of experiencing and doing those emotions. Mm -hmm. But I, I imagine that it's very hard, particularly for Western people and people who have had some education in in psychology to overcome this kind of thinking uh, about emotions, right? Um, that's not a topic of my study, but it's certainly it's my experience that it's very hard. Um, and, you know, in the book, I try it a different way. I'm, I'm trying to say, let's not start there. Let's not assume that. And let's start at, let's start with, I, I used to get questions, um, like I would, I would present, for example, I remember very distinctly, I presented self-report data on um, Japanese and, and American data or with uh, emotion, about emotions. And, you know, I presented those results to an American audience and people would ask me, but how do you know that the, the Japanese don't feel exactly the emotions that Americans feel, but they have social norms to not express them. Yeah. And my answer, you know, in the beginning I didn't, I thought well, self-report, so strictly taken, I don't, right? I don't know that people can self-report whole different things until I, until I reversed it and said, I don't, but how do you know that Americans are not feeling the way Japanese report but are not talking about it that way um, because they have social norms to talk about their emotions this way. And so I was turning around the perspective. And so what I'm asking my, my, reading, my readers to do and what I think is a more productive approach is, why don't we take those data seriously first? And, um, and then, you know, bottom up empirically start, start to infer what is different and what is not different. And I think in the process of doing that, we can find out from each other how those emotions actually feel. And I think that's just a more productive entry to communication about emotions. So, so even, you know, not as a scientist, I think let's take our, let's take our findings seriously before we dismiss them. And as a, as a citizen uh, or as a, as a, a citizen in this multi multicultural worlds and and multicultural societies i think why don't we hear each other out and try to um to resonate with other people's experiences and descriptions rather than challenging them on the basis of what on the basis of our own assumptions about how emotions are um you know, there's also a whole neuroscience part of that, but I'm, I'm not really a specialist on that. But what I have come to realize is that as a scientist, it would be better to be open to what we find rather than say, but it's impossible because we already know. And, and so it's really hard. I mean, what it comes down to, it's really hard to imagine that something that feels as natural and default as your emotions uh, can be cultured. And yet there is a lot of evidence that that it is and we have to find out now, you know, having said that and, and you know, I, I, we all have bodies. We all live together in communities, right? We have societies that have to work in some ways. We have to get along with some people and and resist the pressure of other people. So all of those circumstances, the logical possibilities of relating in the world um, are limited, I think, across the world. But I think apart from that, there are, or within that framework, there are many, there's there's a lot of, um, of possibility for, for variation. But do I hear your skepticism in <laughs> through that question? Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> no, it's just because, of course, since I was, uh, enculturated in a particular way. I mean, it's, and even for people who experience, if we can use that word, emotions in a different way, I mean, it would be the opposite, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's very, very hard to just overcome these psychological tendencies, let's mm -hmm. say. And which psychological tendencies do you refer to? Uh, I mean, in this case, uh, using 
one of the acronyms you use in the bo- in the book having sort of mind mm-hmm. emotions yeah right? yeah yeah i think so in the book i talk about mind emotions to say so it's not so much mind emotions but it's a mind model of emotions mm-hmm. right where we yeah. say that where we where we focus on the mental part the feeling part inside a person and 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 we sort of think that an emotion is an emotion whatever context it occurs anger is anger is anger um and what i'm trying to say is that this way of thinking has been very ingrained in in western cultures maybe also promoted even by the early 70s um psychological knowledge that came out um but uh there are actually other models to look at our emotions and those other models are more um are more central in the way people in many cultures talk about emotions and and i call that an hours model which is Mm -hmm. outside of the person or between people and more as relational acts instead of feelings primarily and more situated that you know my my anger to to my husband is different from my anger at my toddler is different from my anger at the state of affairs in the world um now I don't think it's so far-fetched. I mean, it, it's it's not so hard actually to show that emotions, even in Western cultures, have social functions, right? Mm-hmm. We, so, so at the very least, we can I think um, agree that even if you think that emotions are come with feelings, that they also have social functions. That you know, when you're angry. A little bit dependent on the circumstances, but other people are more than not impressed by it, right? People yield to your wishes more. Um, mm-hmm. You are at least when in certain circumstances, you're given more power or you're ascribed more competence. Um, so there are we know we know that people who even in Western context, people who are embarrassed are liked better afterwards. Um, They're even liked better than when they try to make make up for the mistake. So looking embarrassed or people, other people interpreting you as embarrassed makes them like you. So so we know that that emotions do certain things. We also know that people choose emotions that have a certain effect. And that's, you know, that's very, they don't do it purposely. They don't always do it consciously. But we know that people choose the emotions that are the most effective in their in their experiences. So it's not so hard to see that emotions at least also have this outside part. And, you know, in another way, if I ask you to describe, you know, what it felt like when you were angry at, you know, let's say Trump or Biden or uh, whoever is in your political um, environment or if I or if you were angry at your lover those feelings are probably not exactly the same right it's hard to say one instance of anger is another is the same as another instance of anger so in some ways we can focus on these hours characteristics even within our own culture Um, And so what I'm trying to say is, well, two things. Um, You need ours, you need the ours model, even to understand our, the emotions in Western cultures better. It's useful to look at ours, to trace them back to the outside, rather than just think of them, um, them as feelings. And the other thing I say is, it makes a difference in in a number of ways. It makes a difference whether your culture focuses on the insight uh, uh, of the inside feeling aspect of emotions, or whether your fo- your culture focuses on the outside part of emotions. Um, and so there are cultural differences in using or in in foregrounding these these models, and they also affect emotional processes um, as we know them. So, so those two things I say, I say, um, and you know, I think when you come, you, when you come at it in those ways and try to imagine that 
No, actually, why would we think that anger is one thing, even in our culture? Why would we think anger is is an internal thing rather than also something that happens between people? Why would we think that anger is always the same rather than varying from one situation to another? Then it is not as hard to imagine that there is this other way of looking at emotion. It's just an analytical tool, of course, to look at those same events. But you can use these different tools and and um, and articulate different aspects of the event. Yeah, since we're talking about that, I had this question sort of saved for later, but perhaps it's interesting to ask it now. Uh, I mean, apart from culture and particular contexts, I, get, I would imagine that personality then would also play a role, right? Yeah, I mean, I... Um... I'm, I, I won't elaborate on personality, but I think to the extent that people have different experiences in their lives and, and you know, you would, you would expect them to have different emotions because they build on the experiences they have. So I think of personality as a way of structuring the individual differences that people have in behavior and experiences. And yes, it's one way of it's one way of categorizing experiences for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think that different family, you know, types of families can influence the kinds of experiences you have. So so any any type of you know any way in which you expect the experiences of an individual and the, the expectations and the and the previous instances of emotions to differ, yes, would would affect the way you experience emotions. Do we know how people develop a particular model of emotions, like the mine or the hours model? And of course, I'm not uh, implying that they are mutually exclusive and people can't really have a bit of both, but what mm -hmm. do we know about their development? I don't think we know that much about about it really, but there is some illustrative evidence uh, by a person um, named Ki Wong, a psychologist who looks at narratives and how uh, moms in different cultures uh, um, help their children, their toddlers with narratives. And in those early examples, what you see is that um, she compares Chinese, she's from a Chinese background and she came to America and she compares Chi how Chinese and, and, um, and American moms talk to their children to, with their toddlers about emotional experiences. And she shows that Chinese mothers um, guide their children towards looking at the circumstance, the the consequence, the social consequences of their behavior. So, they say, so what happens? And you know, I was screaming and and yelling, and so what was the consequence? Well, I got punishment. That's the the kind of the course of the emotional. Whereas uh, American moms, even if the kid doesn't talk about feelings, they say, and why were you? Why were you screaming and yelling? And they don't rest until the kid has referred to some subjective state. I am angry. And so the kid is really, we're really uh, helped and, and taught to look inside about what our state of mind is. Now, I also think that's different. I mean, from what we know, that's um, somewhat different. It's, it's uh, somewhat different between socioeconomic class. So I think middle class parents do it more um, than than uh, than parents with um, you know working class parents. Um, on a larger level, and and just connecting it to some of the sociological um, literature, it's um, it's what has happened that made us more interested in subjectivity. And we know that you know in the 19th century, only in the 19th century, subjectivity became more important. So it's also pretty recent in in the history of of, uh, of Western culture that we're so interested in what people feel or how they think about things. And 
the explanation that has been given of that that resonates with me is that we in our current societies we leave a lot of decisions up to the individual that weren't up to the individual in previous societies i mean churches determine how how your life or families or you know your you you basically your family decided who you could marry to uh, your church decided what kind of you know how many children and and what kind of life you lived you took the business of your of your father or you you stepped into there so there were many less you ate what was available to eat um, and so one of the ways of thinking about this emphasis emphasis on emotions is that we're much more left to our own, own devices to make choices about all these areas or all these domains of life that were previously determined for us by external constraints um, and that when you when your life is driven so much by your preferences when you have to make so many choices and you have very few limiting conditions that what what do you look at is you know how much do i like this how good does this make me feel right or how does this make me feel what do, what do i feel about this and so that that your subjective beliefs and and feelings about things have become much more important mm -hmm. um, but I don't, I can't say that I have a large empirical body of data to support that. Um, but I can just imagine that subjectivity, subjectivity is not as central in many parts of the world and in many, um, and, and wasn't as central in many areas of, or eras of, of time uh, as it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, does having uh, a dominant model of emotions like a mine or an hours model have any relationship with well-being? Um, it does in the way I think that uh, well you know it depends a little bit there is a lot of discussion about well-being um, mm -hmm. and Western psychologists have sometimes uh, conflated well-being with feeling happy. Mm -hmm. um, it's very uh, debatable that even in Western cultures, that being happy at every moment is really what determines well-being, right? Uh, people like you and me who read, who read and study, and you know how much immediate gratification do we have? Um, in, in fact, you know, we know that some of the learned long term gratification is dependent on uh, some of the long term well being is dependent on delayed gratification. So, um, but, you know, we do find that some for some research, we find that satisfaction with life, for example, is predicted by positive and negative emotions in some cultures where where feeling is more important and predicted by how much you live, how much you meet your your role expectations, so how much doing you, how much you do the right thing in other cultures. So, so in that sense, I think that there could be a difference in how people judge their life. Um, you know, how how well, how good do I feel, or how well do I fit in? Could be two different considerations for for well being. So. Um, the other, the other um, consequence of mine and ours that there seems to be, but I'm not not sure you're asking about that, is um, there's a lot of there has a lot has been written about people adjusting their emotions and how bad that would be. So there's a whole sociological literature on how people, for example, people who um, who work in customer service, how they um, by how they have to be happy and friendly to their uh, customers, and then they suffer from it. They suffer burnout. They're not. They don't feel authentic, and they suffer from burnout. From what we know now, um, it seems to be that if you identify with your feelings that that's actually a much harder thing to do, that authenticity is a much is much more important than when you, you identify with 
fitting into the situation. So when you look at, you know, what should be happening between people and when that's your model to begin with. So, for example, in um, Chinese um, service, uh, cust people working in, um, in customer service, um, when they had to adjust their emotions, they well when they had to adjust their appearance to their customers they also adjusted their emotions so they just became friendlier and and kinder and they actually don't um don't report as much burnout um so it seems that the way you focus on your emotions may also um you know there are other examples actually actually experimental findings but it doesn't seem to be as hard to suppress your emotions in a context where what really counts, what you're really focused on, is to achieve a certain effect in, interpersonally. And one of the ways in which you can understand that is that when people focus on their emotions out, outside or between people, they have more practice in accommodating their emotions to what the external circumstances require. And it's just less exhausting. It's just more of a thing that you learn to do and that when you're focused on what you feel that actually accommodating to what the relationship requires is a much harder thing to do and that it's it takes effort and that it's it's not it's it's um, it's tiresome and exhausting in the in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there are examples there, all the examples, I would say point in the in the same direction so there are, are multiple studies with multiple methods that point in the direction of people perceiving their and this is my way of describing it but perceiving their emotions more in an uh, through uh, the lens of an hours model have less difficulty making their emotions accommodating their emotions to outside requirements um, but i wouldn't go as far as that there is a robust that there is robust and, and systematic evidence for it. Uh, all the evidence we have points in the same direction, that it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Is the idea that emotions build up inside, if not let out, a particularly weird one? And by weird here, I'm meaning, I'm referring to the acronym Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. You know, I I don't know if it's um, if it's restricted to Western cultures. There are, of course, rituals in others in some other cultures that are cathartic. Also, so um, there are obviously there's there's obviously some thought across cultures that it may be good to express certain emotions or to have a place to have a place to do emotions. I don't know, expressing sounds like, uh, you know, it has to, it is inside already and it has to come outside. Um, that's not necessarily the case, but it is the case that many cultures create opportunities for some kinds of strong emotions, um, not all the same opportunities. Um, at the same time, I think this this idea that every emotion has to be expressed is is somewhat Western. I mean, there are many cultures where you just do what is required from you by the situation and your emotions will, will slowly be modeled to follow what is required by the situation. I'm also hesitating to answer your question because I don't think we always I don't think it's a very, you know, on the one hand, we have this idea of cathartic and that if you don't express it, you know, it will come out in all these negative ways, really the, the Freudian way of looking at emotions. On the other hand, we also know even in, in common parlor that uh, expressions as, you know, count to 10 when you're angry. Like we don't have the common, the common, the lay people's belief doesn't all point in one direction, right? We have ideas about that distraction sometimes is good. Well, distraction means that you lower the emotional in, uh, intensity without giving way to the to the emotions, right? So we we have a very a very mixed palette. If you say 
you know, people in emotion research will think that the natural way of emotions is to come out. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that we consistently think about it that way. We talk in our everyday communication, we talk about emotions in all these different ways. But there are definitely cultures in which the idea is even less that there are feelings or, or opinions or emotions that are inside and that need to come out. That is a very Western idea with actually my culture of our origin, the Netherlands is I think almost number one in it. You need to sort of turn yourself inside out and that's the right way of being. Um, but I don't think there is anything natural about that. Uh, there is one that is one way of looking at emotions, but there are other ways. Mm -hmm. uh, how does studying emotion connect to uh, child development? Like, for example, uh, raising a child, does it tell us anything about that? About how, in a particular cultural context, uh, a child should be risen, for example? Yeah. Um, you find big differences in the emotions that parents try to socialize in their uh, in their children and mm -hmm. i think the best way is to give some examples um yeah. i mean in certainly in america certainly in middle class america white i would say uh what you try to do and i think it has penetrated much of western europe actually um, the idea is that you need that your child needs to feel good about themselves, right? And uh, mm -hmm. they need to be happy and proud of themselves. So we we don't use that word. We need we use self-esteem and we use confidence and all of those things. But basically, we try to to tell our children that they're wonderful and that we try to create opportunities where they can feel good about themselves. We try to create success up success experiences. Um, and it's good to to understand that that is related to a certain way of conceiving what a child should be able to do. And I think, you know, especially in in um, in the US, the idea is that a child should independently achieve. They should believe in themselves. I mean, it's it really is the, the main point is that a child could could, um, you know, independently uh, prove themselves to be worthy in the in the the big world by themselves. Um, that idea is certainly not shared by a lot of cultures, and so in many cultures, it's much more important that a child be either um, know their proper place in the in the hierarchy, um, you know, be fit in, um, and in a lot of, for example, East Asian cultures. It's um, it's really weird to praise your child. It's much more common to point out how your child fell short of, you know, being a proper member of the society. And the child should actually be taught to feel shame. And so, Chinese mothers, when they're asked, they say that that shame a shameless child that is a problem. It's uh, the shameful child that they try to to cultivate. Um, and there are also cultures in which, you know, it's important to be empathetic more than feel good about yourself, where it's, uh, and so these are cultures where it's really important to, um, to be able to imagine what other people feel, to anticipate what other people feel. Um, so I think child's, so, so I think from reading the child's literature, I can't give every example that I came across, but that really how people socialize emotion has a lot to do with what the what the function the social functions are of those um, of those emotions. So being pr pride, the social function is to show other people how good you are and that you're probably a little bit better than they are, um, and that you and that you should be granted autonomy and success. Um, a shame, shame tells people I'm willing to accommodate. And if that's the kind of child that you're trying to raise, then shame, shame plays a much more important role in the, um, in, in the child rearing. Um, and, you know, and, and that's true for a lot of emotions. So what you see is that emotions are used a lot 
to bring home to to um, to bring home um, to children what kind of a person is desired and valuable in that culture. Mm -hmm. With all of that in mind, do you think that it makes sense to think that there would be any universally right or wrong ways of raising children? I'm asking you that because it seems to me, I might be wrong, but it seems to me that particularly developmental psychologists and also clinical psychologists tend to have this idea that there really is a universally wrong or right way of raising children emotionally and uh, in other psychological aspects. Yeah. Yeah, I think they are. I think a lot of that knowledge needs to be contextualized. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just to add a little bit, um, you know, often the ways often those ways fit in a society, right? We, uh, we also don't know. So, so my, so to the short answer would be, I think that, you know, I think that not providing for a child is universally bad. Um, injuring them, uh, we can agree on is, is, is of course bad. Um, you know, I not providing for their physical safety is probably bad. Um, but beyond that, I think we have to be really careful because people try to, what we can say is that certain emotion leads to certain ways of being in a culture. Um, so we know if you don't, you know, if, if a child doesn't have self-esteem, then it may be hard to function in some environments where you mm -hmm. depend on self-esteem. Um, but self-esteem in some cultures may be good and self-esteem in other cultures may be considered arrogant and mm -hmm. you know, too self-certain. The same with um, shame. I think, you know, shame in, in America is that is there's a whole mostly psychoanalytic literature that says that children who have been shamed are worse off and, and shame is, is associated with depression and with self-criticism later in life. and with not, with ill functioning, um, that, that association is not found cross-culturally. And in fact, shame often uh, leads to, in many of those cultures that, that want to cultivate shame, it's often a condition to be accepted by your family and to be loved by your family. Because if you are the shameful child, then your family can can love you and you have shown that your family is a good family that you you know that your parents for example taught you to be a proper kind of child and so the effects of shame are much less distancing and much more inclusive than they would be in a in a cultural context and i'm afraid that many um culture many clinical and developmental psychologists um operate within a small um in a small context, uh, and that context cannot be generalized um, beyond, you know, that the findings there cannot be generalized beyond that context. And we should be very, very much aware, I think, of the different meanings of these emotions and these child rearing practices in different, in different social and cultural contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, it's not necessarily the case that particularly the clinical psychologists are doing bad work by thinking that way. It's just that if they are put into a multicultural context to work to work in, then there specifically, it might be an issue. Right? Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, exactly what I think. I think that that um, that the context needs to be taken into consideration, and that for that context, they they may have very good recommendations. Also, of course, considering there are two two things that I want to add: um, demands, demands, cultural demands, and social demands are changing, as are insights into our child rearing. It's it's not so long ago that even in the United States, people raised their children with fear, mm -hmm. and you know the idea the idea that um, that parental love is the the cornerstone of of development is not so old. It's 19th century um, United States. Um, so we have to be aware that what that what we consider good parenting is 
uh, is subject to change and maybe also to change in our expectations of what a child should be later on. And the second one is that um, it's not just culture in the sense of national cu culture, but there are also very big differences in um, socioeconomic culture that may coincide with differences in the kind of roles that people are um, expected to take on. And so this is not, it's also, it's also emotion research, but it's also research um, generally of child rearing that working class children are being prepared for jobs where they basically carry out what other people want them to do, right? Other mm -hmm. different than middle class kids who have, who often have jobs and personal environments where they have much more opportunity to, to make choices. And so what you see in child rearing and in expectations is that the middle class kids are much more socialized um, to develop preferences, to look at internal feelings, um, to express what they feel, um, whereas working class um, kids are much more uh, socialized to sometimes obey rules, um, to just do things rather that are expected rather than, and to not particularly not be loved in this soft way of you're wonderful, but in, in a way that makes them experience, that makes them tough, basically prepares them for the environment that they will meet when they grow up. So even there, I think that it's important to know that we all, when we, um, when we think about development, that we have implicitly these developmental goals in mind. And so um, a lot of the, of the literature is also based on, sorry, I was shocked because I heard some door slam. Um, so, I, uh, so it's good, I think, to have in mind that we implicitly aim for certain types of children uh, mm -hmm. and prepare them for certain positions also in, in, the, in our society. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the approach to emotions you explore in the book would also change the way we think about attachment styles? Um, I find it really, I, I, I find that a really hard question. Um, uh, what I know for sure is that the, the way Western psychologists have gone about um, measuring attachment uh, is uh, just does not resonate in a lot of non-Western cultures. And I can tell you wh why. Mm -hmm. um, so the attachment paradigm is that you, you leave your, so the child is with the mother. The idea of the child and the mother, you know, if the, the, if the, if the, uh, if the bond between the child and the mother is secure enough, the child can explore by themselves. Um, they don't like it when the mother goes away, but they will welcome the mother back. And this is, I think this is a model of a good relationship that basically supports you to be independent, right? And then independently explore the, explore the, the world. Well, you can see why that is Western. It's not so much, it doesn't have so much to do with the mine and ours models, but you can see why it's a Western idea that you know, really what relationships are for is to give you an idea that the world is safe, to provide you, and then you by yourself go out in the world and explore. And one of the ways in which this experiment didn't work is that uh, in some African cu cultures or in Japan, children had never been separated from their mothers. That had just never happened. So you leave them alone. This is the first time that they ever have been alone so it's just this, it's not testing how safe the relationship is. It's putting these children in an extremely weird, weird, unusual, out of the ordinary situation. And so it's not those, none of those children goes out and explore and is happy when the mother is. They're shocked but they, because they have never had a situation like that. They, are, they have been carried body to body um, all of their lives. And this is the first time that they're left alone. So. What I'm thinking is that our way of 
uh, attachment, and there is actually some work on cross-cultural attachment that I don't know so well. Um, but what I know from the beginning is that we will have to reconceptualize what is a normal relationship in order to um, to uh, to conceptualize what is a non-secure uh, relationship. So, so the equation of a secure relationship with being able to do whatever is expected in Western middle class mothers and infants, um, that will have to be translated to something that's more generally applicable. Now, could we possibly have something like a good bond and a bad bond? Um, there is some idea that um, that uh, responding responsiveness of caregivers is a is is somewhat universal. I don't know a lot about that research, but I could imagine that a responsive mom, however that gets operationalized, is good across or a responsive dad. I mean, a responsive caregiver is good across culture. So I'm not saying that there that nothing like attachment could could be, you know, the case, but I do think we have to redefine it to be more broadly applicable in the world. Mm -hmm. So in the book, you go through several different emotions, starting with anger and shame, for example. Could you tell us, perhaps give us some examples of how these emotions perhaps manifest in different particular cultural contexts and perhaps how they are thought about by people from different cultures. Yeah, so what is interested in, in shame and anger, and, and we and others did a lot of research about them, is that um, they're each other's mirror image sometimes, that in cultures where individuals are important, yeah, where it's in the important to draw the boundaries between people, I would say. Uh, anger is uh, is very much valued and shame is devalued because shame shows you, anger shows, uh, with anger you assert yourself and you assert your rights, and with shame you basically say I'm willing to accommodate. Um, now for, for communities where, you know, relational harmony is the, is the goal, um, and so where it's where it's the, the an individual's task is to accommodate and to fit into a larger community or to, into relationships, shame is actually valued and anger is not valued because it's you know is at disharmony with this harmony. Um, so that's the first way that and I think you can you can understand that from the social functions, right? If you think that anger is self-assertive and and shame is accommodating. You can say, well, in some cultures, the self-assertion self is valued. In other cultures, it's not. It's actually disvalued and, mm -hmm. and the reverse for shame. Um, that's where it starts, I think. But then, um, then I think it's good to say that, that when, you're, when you grow up in a culture that Emotions are often, emotions don't happen in a vacuum. They happen often in interactions. And so what happens is that when you have anger and other people respond to it, you may yield more, you may go into it more, you may express it more, you're used to other people rewarding it more. Um, and so the anger develops into a completely different kind of script or interaction than in um, in cultures where um, anger is disvalued and people are basically and so we so one of the one of the studies that I was telling you about before is that uh, where we where we compared anger episodes in Japan in and in the United States and our Japanese respondents were telling us that they you know they were angry if somebody offended them but then they were trying to wonder how you know, what they had done wrong uh, or why the other person might not have been, uh, you know, might not have been able to act differently. And they usually did the most basic default response was that they didn't do anything when they were angry. And actually when they didn't do and didn't show anything, they also started to feel less angry. Now, 
if you just compare that with American anger, which was always, which was often consisted of blaming the other person, saying what a bad person this was, how unreasonable this was, um, taking distance, taking revenge, um, uh, you know, uh, recruiting other people to support you in in your anger. All of this was a very different different um, course of event, a very different episode. So when you start describing emotions not as things, but as episodes as they occur in the world, then their embedding, their social embedding and their value really um, affects how they enroll or unfold uh, and what they typically what they typically are and what you're expecting when you have these emotions and also what you feel. I mean, anger reinforced and and lived uh, and lived out and amplified feels different than anger regulated suppressed uh you know reconsidered uh, and not being consequential so that i think is is uh is the story about these emotions is the intention or the social functionality is different is well it probably we we call it anger or we call it uh, shame because there is something similar in the functionality but then the way they are appreciated are very different across cultures and that means that the way they unfold in social life in real is very different and so that the category of experiences that we then come to call anger in one culture and anger in another culture or shame in one culture and shame in another culture becomes a very different one and that's what you draw on when you have a new experience of anger and or shame. Mm -hmm. Is that clear? It's a lot of messages packed together, but um, but I think I think there's a really big difference between the anger experiences in in different cultures, depending on what place anger has in the valued relationship in that culture and the same for a reverse actually for for shame. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, talking now about love and happiness. So are all intimate relationships based on love cross culturally? You know, they're not. Um, I, I, I'm not even sure there. There's certainly, you know, in some cultures, it's this idea of love as, you know, as finding somebody better than others, uh, having mutual admiration or attraction, longing for somebody else, um, that underlies a lot of Western relationships is certainly not, not general. And I think in some cultures, um, love is more, well, in some cultures, it's much less the internal feelings as it is what you do for each other. So this is the mine and the and the hours model. Um, Chinese love is how you take care of each other. It's not how much you say you love each other or how highly you esteem somebody or how very attractive you find. It's just, do you take care? Do you do enough work for the other? That's how much you love them. Um, but you can also say in some cultures it's not so much relation, close relationships are just there. They're defined by your by your family association, by your proximity, by, you know, uh, determined if it's in the case of marriage is determined by your families on how much you want to merge. And in mo many cultures it's not so much based on love, but on uh, the relationship is there and from there on you need to deal with it. So um, one of the things when my students, both in America and in, in Belgium, when they think about close relationships in interdependent or collectivist cultures, they often think about people who are very close with each other, who love each other a lot, who are very, you know, who have no distance. That's not what interdependence is about. Often interdependence is about saving each other from the burden of being so close. So when you look at social support research that um, my colleagues Hee Jung Kim and, and David Sherman did um, with Koreans and with Americans, you see that the Koreans who are very close, 
they don't tell the other person about their problems as much. Um, and especially they don't tell the other person when they know this other person is busy or is, is charged. So the closeness in this case doesn't, isn't about, you know, how intimate or close or, or dependent you are. No, to the contrary, it's how much you take the other person into consideration. So it's a very different set of considerations of intimate relationships than, than I think uh, many Westerners have in close relationships. What you also have is that in in cultures where closeness is kind of predefined, you know, clans or friends are 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 together. There is a lot of there is a lot of interdependence. People starting to uh, protect their resources. So when when interdependent is related to um, to material and, and emotional support, not just to emotional support, and people start, material support is, is limited, right? Maybe even more limited than emotional support. And so people start protecting them themselves um, from friendships, and they're even starting to be suspicious about why would this person want to be friends with me? And so what you, my, my colleague, um, Glenn Adams, they did research in Ghana and found that people were actually not so much interested in friendships, but in in enemy ships, and they were very concerned with um, being um, being exploited by other people, by people who pretended to be close, but then really uh, wanted to have your resources. So the idea that close relationships are built on feelings of love, I think, is li really limited. It's probably limited in our own society, but it's still kind of the model of intimate relationships in, in Western, and when I say our own, I mean Western society, Western Europe, United States, but the middle class. Um, but in many other groups and societies, um, you know, I, I know that working class, in working class families, um, there's much less mobility and people are much more dependent on each other and also dependent on each other's resources. Um, I would imagine that friendships and relationships are also based on different on different motivations than just on how wonderful another how wonderful you think another person is. So this kind of attraction and and wonderful and elevation that we um, that we that we think love is. Um, in in Western middle class environments, so so yeah, I I do think um, close relationships are not built certainly not on love as we know it, and probably not on love exclusively, um, and that there are also differences in cultures in in how much relationships are organized around love. Mm -hmm. And what about happiness? Is it that even cross-culturally people have the same understanding of happiness and do all people even care about it? Not everybody cares about it. Um, happiness is not is not particularly a goal in many in many it's uh, you know it's in the American Constitution as we know. Um, it you know it wasn't it wasn't always um, a goal of people. If you uh, you look at even at you know the Calvinist past of in the Netherlands, that wasn't happiness was for the next life. That wasn't for this life. It was duty and responsibility. Um, so I I don't think happiness is is a goal in many in many cultures. Um, in many cultures, it's it's being able to meet the demands. It's being it being able to meet role expectations. It's being able to provide for for uh, close ones. It's being good, being religious, for example. It can be, uh, you know, but living living according to God's rules or will. Or I'm just mentioning different different alternative uh, goals. And it's not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily include happiness. But even if, even in cultures that do, even when happiness is uh, a desired goal, then happiness is not always um, always understood in the same way. And so mm -hmm. my my colleague, uh, psychologist Jeannie Tsai, has done a lot of research on happiness in in East Asian and and European Americans, and also in 
European Americans and, and East Asians in East Asia. And what she finds is that the, the European American ideal of happiness is much more activated. It's much more excited, happy in that kind of way, excited. And that calm is actually a much more desirable state in, in many East Asian um, societies. So we also have to be um, careful about what we mean when we say happy or what, what good feelings. In, in the book I say, everybody wants good feelings in some way, but what those good feelings are uh, may be very different in, in different cultures. Mm -hmm. And of course, we use words, language to talk about emotions, uh, I think, in all cultures. So do children learn to associate particular words to emotions, being them sort of more mine or ours models of emotions? Or how does it work exactly? Yeah, I think... You know, we we again we we don't really know how it works. There is there is an idea that um, it's um, it worked. One idea that um, my postdoc Katie Homan and and some of her colleagues, not including me, have about uh, emotion concept learning is that children learn about emotions as they learn about abstract categories. So how do we learn what justice is or mm -hmm or um, um, what would it be another honesty. Mm -hmm. We find we have these different instances that people that other people associate with those, you know, you say that's really, that's fair or that's not fair, right? But there are, so we accumulate those instances of justice and then come to an abstract understanding. And mm -hmm. that's probably what we do with emotions. Um, we parents, Parents point emotions out to children. They talk about emotions a lot, and they talk about emotions when things happen in the environment, right? And um, you know, I would I would think, but I don't know the research about that. That what I what I told you about Si Wang that when you talk, when you have narratives with children, when you repeat stories about experiences that you can that you say. That's that time where you were angry, right? And you can refer to what you were feeling or you can refer to what happened and what were the social consequences. And so my idea would be that um, in different cultures, the different aspects of emotions are more regular so that we in, in Western cultures, we talk more about feeling. I mean, ultimately, of course, what parents have access to is are the circumstances and the actions of a child, right? They cannot feel, a parent doesn't feel what the child feels. So the access, and this is a Wittgenstein has remarked that, all we can put our labels on is, are the things that are observable in the world. We don't share anything else among us. We can't look in each other's soul. But having said that, parents can prompt more for the feelings or for what you thought, what was going on in you, or they can they can they can uh, draw your attention to things that are going out going on in the world, like what other how other people responded, and look, you felt shame, and because everybody else thought you were um, a poorly raised child, see that that's why we felt shame, or look at how bad you felt. Um, so I think that's why how parents help create parents single out the aspects of the world that deserve attention and, and so societies in general, environments in general, single those out. Um, and they also provide not just parents, but parents in the first place and then later peers and, and, and other caregivers and the larger society as a whole. Um, so we learn those. We learn to as associate those categories with different instances, and those instances are partly we learn them because that's what we encounter. Th those are which we encounter, and in part because people point out that these, you know, they say, "Oh, you must feel angry," or the girl in the storybook felt angry, or you know, "Mommy fe feels angry." So. 
the child gets to discover the regularities of that of that category by parents and others associating certain instances of experience to those labels. Mm -hmm. And you know, this is why I said both the labels in the beginning that if you think about what emotions are, they have two kinds of inputs. You have the input of the kinds of social experiences that we have, that we encountered in the worlds that we live in. And they have the input of the of the language that is available. We don't come into this into this this world inventing a language. We use some of the words that that the language has left us, right? That that we grow into this social environment that already or we come into this social environment that already exists. Mm -hmm. And still about language, what does it tell us that uh, different languages have different emotion words and uh, some have more of them and others have fewer? I think it tells us um, first and foremost that people make different kinds of distinctions and, you know, and fewer and more distinctions in this in this emotional life so some but also different distinctions um so their words there's a, a large um study by kristen linkrist and her colleagues who study which in in different languages which emotions share words so for example if i have the same word for something like envy and anger it basically means that the language doesn't distinguish between envy and, and anger, right? Well, that's the case in some languages, but other languages don't distinguish between anger and sad. So probably what we can infer from that is that people draw the boundaries of emotional categories around different kinds of events. That's what it, what it tells you. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think, and, and this is of course a discussion, is it possible to recognize an instance of another person's, you know, of a, an instance that your language doesn't distinguish? Yeah, it is possible. Would you automatically or radically distinguish those experiences? Probably not. Would you have all the associations and all the knowledge that you have uh, as you have when your language knows an emotion? Uh, an emotion words? No, you don't. So it ha you know, they're, they're, a language is basically the input for your experiences, but it's not the only input for your experiences. So words are not the only way. I mean, you know, first of all, there are also other, other ways of describing emotions in a language than just having a word, of course. I can describe my, my feelings. Um, but a word is a word is a salient category. That that is what you can that you what you can infer from it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if emotions are culturally constructed, uh, is there any any evidence that there there are sensitive periods in development for acquiring culturally any sort of emotions you have to acquire in a particular cultural context? We don't have that much evidence. Um, we, you know, I would say periods, we don't have that much evidence. The, the evidence on biculturals uh, is, is really limited. Um, you know, with that caveat in mind, I haven't seen evidence that it's, that there is a critical period. What I have seen evidence of is that all your experience counts. So if I have, um, if I have 10 years of experience in the United States and 40 years in, in the Netherlands, um, then my, you know, my, the 10 years of experience counts, but I also have the experience in the Netherlands and that's also going to count. So I think I, I haven't seen, it's not, I, I can't rule it out, but from the evidence we have, we don't really have evidence of, of people not being able to learn new emotions anymore. Actually, to the extent that we have contact with new people and that we interact and, you know, we, we, can, we can come to see the world in a different way. We can come to 
experience the different the world in a different way but we also never erase the experiences that we've had so you can you know one of the things that we're trying to look for is is it possible that biculturals become adjusted are, are more contextualized so that their emotional experience is more contextualized so that I, when i'm in an in an american context i have more feelings that fit with that american context and that when i come back to the to a dutch context um, that i'm more feeling my emotions as a dutch person and we don't know that we don't know if they're individual different we don't know if if codes we have some evidence that code switching happens um, we don't know what the limitations are. We don't know what the individual differences are. So that's really a huge field of experience that is open for exploration. But I think that has only opened up um, because we acknowledge that there could be di cultural differences in emotions. Because if you think about it, if you think of emotions as, you know, they're just natural. Well, you know, you just carry them with you biological things that you have so the the question only poses itself once you um, acknowledge that there are differences in how people experience perceive do emotions in different cultures and and there i have to say um we're just starting to do this research of what what how does it work with biculturals mm -hmm. and when it comes to emotions specifically uh, how challenging can it be for people to live in a multicultural world? Um, it can be very challenging. I mean, I uh, I think many many people feel um, feel somewhat lost, uh, somewhat like they're not they're not doing you know they're they're not doing the right thing. They're not in. They're not in tune with the rest of their environment. Um, we there again. I mean, we don't know specifically how we we know that have doing emotions a certain way is really important for your relationships. So we can only infer that when you don't do emotionships in in a way that other people recognize that there will be some problems in in relation that people don't recognize you as of their group that they think you're inappropriate that you think that that you don't understand their responses and we're only starting to to study really what kind of consequences that has um and how you know and how you can bridge uh, any gap in emotions that may occur um but but what we do know is that emotional similarity is is a is a predictor on how close people feel um on in some studies it's it's a predictor of relationship quality um so so we have reason to to assume that that it will be really an issue also in for immigrants or for people from a different cultural group in in adjustment in a new cultural group or vice versa but mm -hmm. uh, we've been talking a lot about how emotions differ uh, across cultures but does that also include for example differences across socioeconomic strata and across subcultures and even for example uh, between the sexes and here I'm not implying that they would be necessarily biological or innate they mm -hmm. would be the result of socialization of course and also across individuals yeah I think yes I mean uh, I I would say we have some evidence for social economic class I mean I think to the extent that you expect people to be to do their relationships differently um you know and they have different experiences yeah you would expect some differences in, in 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 the way they do emotions too and i give some examples in my book of the different kinds of of differences um i think psychologically speaking there's really not that much difference between a culture defined by uh geogra by national boundaries or a culture defined by any different kind of 
uh, you know, it's what is what is important are the meanings, the expectations, the uh, encounter of certain experiences. And those can differ uh, to the extent that they differ between those different groups. I think you would expect different emotions. Yeah, I think I had a very, I have a very different emotional life than my grandmother had, um, you know, so even cohorts. Um, so, yeah, I think that when experience and, and, and circumstances and, you know, and, and positions are important, then you would expect that they are important across all those different group boundaries, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, people talk a lot, uh, a lot about the role of empathy, but since there are these cross-cultural differences and differences across all sorts of domains, do you think that empathy is really that useful when it comes to someone trying to understand the emotions of other people? You know, um, the empathy literature is a, is a little cluttered. And sometimes people mean by empathy, feeling what you feel. And I mm -hmm. think that's not, or trying to feel what you feel. And I think that is not so useful in that, you know, I, if I try to imagine myself in your position, I may, might feel something different because my culture, my experiences have been different. So what I'm trying to argue for in the book is that you can resonate with people. You can try to cognitively empathize them or sympathize with them, trying to understand how the, how the world views, so how the world looks from their perspective, rather than trying to imagine yourself in that in that position. So, what would I feel if I were you is maybe less important than what would you feel if you were you, and what are your considerations? What is important for you? Uh, what is at stake for you at this point? What do the emotions mean? Are they good or are they bad? What have they? What have you learned in the past about these emotions? How do you expect other people will will um, will respond to you or to your situation or to your emotions? I think that's more important than trying to imagine how I would feel in your situation. So, mm -hmm. so you know, so is is empathy? I would rather talk about about resonating with other people than empathizing with other people. And I think that some ways in, in which empathy has been um, has been uh, interpreted as, you know, I put myself in your shoes. I don't think that's going to work because if I put myself in your shoes, I'm still taking my values and my experiences and my the world as I know it with me. And that's not going to help me help me imagine how you feel. Um, but if I resonate with you and try to imagine how it would be for somebody in your culture with your concerns and your values and your environment to be in that situation, I might get a little further. So, so empathy, no, resonance, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've already touched a little bit on the, this question when earlier we talked about developmental and clinical psychology applied to child rearing. But what other sort of applications do you think that an understanding of what emotions are and how they work could have? Yeah, I think in any, you know, in any part of the world um, where emotion play a role in, you know, in, in, in politics, in, um, in work environments, in, uh, in consumer behavior, in advertising, all of those, rely on certain understandings of emotions on that we know what emotions are good and what emotions are bad that we know we think we know what it means when somebody responds in a certain way we think we can read their their emotions from their face and from their behavior i think in all of those cases we would be better off postponing our judgment and and making sure that we understand it for for that environment and and making you know, especially being aware that our knowledge is often contextualized. And so when I'm asking my students if they report re um, research now, I, say, I, I ask them, and where was the research done? And 
with with what kind of participants, what, what kind of people? Um, how sure do we know that we can trust that if we want to make conclusions or inferences for another kind of person? And I, what I don't want to say is that emotions, you know, what we can learn from emotions of a person is what are the kinds of things that are important for, for these people in these cultures and how are they important? So it's, I think we should use emotion to figure out what is important and how, how other cultures work rather than um, to, to see them as final evidence of what is important and what people try to, try to convey. Um, and so I, yeah, I think it's it's really important. Emotions, cultural differences in emotions, are really important for a lot of different um, fields. Um, I, I mentioned in my in my book also um, justice. I mean the legal uh, everything, you know, the law. Um, you know, we we think we know that different cultures in different regions actually think they know different things about people, but, you know, what, what do we know about, um, you know, how important is it that somebody feels, shows guilt or remorse? How sure are we that that means that, you know, they don't care about it? Or is it something else? Mm -hmm. uh, what do we know if people don't respond or don't engage in the conversation? How sure are we that that means they're not interested or that they're not impacted? Um, you know, all of those things I think can be can be questioned and should be questioned. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking a lot about how culture makes emotions, but does it also work the other way around? The, do emotions also make culture, and if so, how? Yeah, I I think they do. Um, you know, imagine a place where People have, I mean, I, I think our cultures are um, importantly shaped by the emotions that occur. I mean, imagine a place where people are angry a lot and not ashamed a lot. Um, that's a place where many, that's a culture where many people demand their rights, where many people set boundaries, instead of a culture where many people, you know, question themselves, accommodate to norms, you already can see a, a very different culture and a very different net of relationships um, emerge. And so emotions are in some, some ways, ways of making, of, of uh, spinning the relationships with other people. And yes, our institutions build on those. Um, so I think I think it's it's both ways. We do we do uh, our emotions are um, making the relationships that are done together, constituting the society that we live in. So it's it's definitely two ways. Mm -hmm. So I have a set of three or four final questions about uh, I think the opposite of what we've been talking about here. That is the universality of emotions. And of course, a very big figure in the last few decades on the field in the field has been Paul Ekman. So what do you think about his work on the topic? Well, I think, you know, at the time, I, I will credit Paul Ekman with making emotions researchable, a topic of research in psychology. I mean, before that, he he uh, pinned it down to an experimental, you know, he made it a, a topic of knowledge on which you could collect evidence. Now, from what I know, um, his findings were a little bit more ambiguous than what he presented. So there were some, some you know, there in, in lots of ways. And, you know, hindsight is always easy. So what he found is, there was a set of six phases. And when you offered people the words for emotion, emotion words, six emotion words, they mm -hmm. could above chance, they could, they could relate or associate the emotion intended with the face intended, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, 
what we found, what, first of all, you know, one of the findings is that when we give people those emotion words, we already say it has to be an emotion, first of all. You give people information, right? Mm -hmm. They don't just look at the face and say, what is this? What does this person want? Or what is this person right. going to do? So they already, you give them as a researcher, you make, you make the task that they have to see an emotion. And that seems to make an, an enormous difference. Um, so when people have not been given those emotions, they're actually not able to differentiate those emotions as well. The other question is, you know, do people see emotions or do they see something that's related to emotions? For example, can you see positive or negative? Can you see arousal? And is that related to emotion? And it seems to be that whether you have people connected with emotions or with something that my advisor Nico Freida called action readiness, what does this person want to do? The recognition rate is just as high. So there is no reason, there is no reason to believe that people actually see emotions. The third thing is that when you do it in different cultures and you don't give them emotion words, is that some of those cultures do not see emotions at, at all. They see positive and negative, but they don't see anything beyond it. So um, the, the, the last thing is that some of those cultures don't see emotions as much, but they see behaviors like this person is about to cry or this person is about to laugh. So it's very, you know, that the most that you can see something in the face is, is clear. Faces do certain things, but that we see emotions, we now know that, that that's actually not the case. So that's what I think about Paul Ackman's work. There has been a lot of work, I think, to second guess it. At the same time, we all stand on the shoulders of his work because there was work to, to refute. Um, but I would say that we now know that if we if we release some of the restrictions of that experimental paradigm, that we don't have the same conclusions, where we don't find the same things. Another thing that we have done, um, uh, Phoebe Ellsworth and uh, Taka Masada and, and I and some other collaborators, we have looked at, we have given people those faces, but those faces surrounded by other faces. Mm -hmm. And we find that in some cultures, namely Western cultures, it doesn't matter whether you add other faces. When you say, what does the middle person feel? People look only at the face. But in other cultures, just like Japan, people actually infer the feelings of, of the target person from the, from the faces of what everybody else feels also. Mm -hmm. And so the whole task itself is probably a paradigm that, that replicates what some people do, but not what the perceptual, what the origin, what the what the actual perceptual task is, in a lot of other cultures. So there are a lot of things that you can you can comment on, and that a lot of ways in which we have built on those initial uh, findings, and where our understanding is a lot more nuanced now, and where we wouldn't draw the same conclusions as Paul Ackman did. Um, but it was it was a very um, it was on the other hand uh, he he turns the field of emotions into a researchable field, and I think that has uh, sparked a lot of interest. And, and emotion now is a is a topic that is studied everywhere in psychology. So, right. And what do you make of evolutionary approaches to emotion? Like, for example, trying to study the phylogenetic basis of emotion, like someone like Charles Darwin tried to do uh, in the 19th century. I think it was in The Descent of Man that he talked a lot about uh, comparisons in emotional expression across different species, particularly mm -hmm. the great apes. Uh, do you think that that's a compelling approach or not? So, you know, there again, um, what do we really, what, what do we really see? Um, there is evidence that when you show, uh, for example, apes uh, facial expression without words, that people have nothing, that people don't, do not perceive any emotion. So, so the question is what, you know, what drives the perception? But there are other questions there. Um, 
you know, what what we can see is if certain mu facial muscles um, are similar, mm -hmm. and you know, there is no reason to suppose that they're completely different, right? Especially with our our closest ancestors. What we can also see is that some situations in their most abstract form may be similar. Like, you know, there is there is something like opposition, there's something like closeness, there's something about distancing, there's probably some hierarchical, you know, you can be up or down in a hierarchy. Um, so just like universality of, you know, what I said about universality of conditions, there could be some phylogenetic similarity in conditions in this abstract form, and there could be some phylogenetic similarity in facial musculature. But then the question is, does that mean that there are similar emotions? I mean, if you think about emotions as interpretations of the world with all their complexity and, you know, a categorization of of your experiences in terms of an emotion category, we're pretty clear that animals cannot do that. Mm -hmm. So, so my colleague uh, Lisa Feldman Baird would say, what you see is human projection on animal behavior. But what you don't, what that doesn't give you evidence for, is that that animals have those emotions now. I think it's a little bit of a of a definitional question. Um, you know, if if you know, if you talk about are there conditions that um, animals don't like and where they withdraw, or animals see as an obstacle and they attack. Um, you know, if you're willing to call that an emotion. I mean, Lisa Feldman Barrett would call that emotion. I would probably also not call it emotion, but then you are talking about the definition of emotion. But that means you have very limited inference from those, from that literature to human emotions. But, you know, I don't, I don't believe in creation. I believe in, in evolution. So it's just what, yes, our bodies have similarities. I don't, you know, I don't think we're completely different from animals. But it may be that what we're talking about or most interested about with regard to human emotions is something that we don't share with animals. Mm -hmm. But if we're interested in muscular, the use of muscu facial musculature, then, then yes. <laughs> okay, so, uh, and what do you think about the idea of basic emotions? Do you think it makes sense? You know, basic emotions always is in contrast to something that is not basic. And um, I don't know what the criterion would be of the, of the basic. Um, so there is a, a pretty old, actually, article, 1992, by um, by Andrew Ortoni, who says, who looks at all the basic emotions theories and says, so what is the claim on the basicness of that emotion? And then shows that they're basic on the basis of very different criteria. Um, I, you know, I. I don't know what, in my conception of emotion, there is no place for basic so much because I don't know basic as opposed to what. Mm -hmm. um, what he, his conclusion is, by the way, that, um, that the only two basic emotions are positive and negative. <laughs> yeah, and my last question would be then, what about the valence of emotions? Uh, yeah. Can it be universal or not? Um, you know, if you if you think about the valence experience, I I could imagine that there are bodily processes that make it so that you know mm -hmm. we have we have you know that there is introception of signals that are inherently pleasant or inherently unpleasant. 
what we do know is so that's yes that could be universal i i don't know that that's not my area of expertise but i don't know that um we have to be careful about calling emotions positive or negative because we know that the emotions that are considered negative in some cultures are not necessarily considered negative in other cultures so right. so when it is a, a sort of a meta judgment about the emotions no i i know for sure but when it is about the phenomenological quality of of valence of pleasant and unpleasant it's very possible it's also possible that we actually have more pleasants and more unpleasant that it's not one dimension mm -hmm. um and and that um honestly i i that's not my i i look at the neuroscientists and particularly the uh the people who know more about dopamine and, and endorphins and you know there are probably many many positives but mm -hmm. we have bodies I never said our bodies weren't weren't similar. Yeah. Right. So uh, the book is again between us. How cultures create emotions. I will be leaving a link to it in the description box of this interview. Uh, Doctor Mosquita, apart from the book, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Yes, definitely. Um, I have a website, um, batyamesquita.com, that has all the information on the book and on the events that happen around it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for your time. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. It's been a, a real pleasure to talk to you, Ricardo. Thank you for having me. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klimpy, Matthew Whittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narci, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernadini, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermiti Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gage, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackelford, Sunny Smith and John Wiseman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetano, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardus Francis, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Ruggieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.